So can you just add them? Yeah, to the list. Right, we better get it going. Where are we? Yeah, uh, there we go. Right, ready? Order, order. Um, I'm not going to go through the preamble. Um, Gordon Henderson to move the motion. House has considered the pension aid of prison officers. Um, Mr. Charles, uh, Sir Charles, rather, uh, just over two years ago, at 4:30 p.m. on Tuesday, the 8th of October, 2019, I stood here and made a speech in which I pleaded with the then prisons minister to listen to the concerns of our fantastic prison officers and let them retire at 60. In the same way that comparable. Uh, frontline emergency workers in the police and the fire service are allowed to do. Now, sadly, my pleas fell on deaf ears, and many prison officers still face the prospect of having to work until they're 68. So I make no apologies for raising the subject yet again on behalf of the many hard-working people who work in the prison service, mm. and in particular, those based in the three prisons in my constituency, Elmley, Stamford Hill and Swaleside. The people working in our prisons do a very important and difficult job, and for the most part, don't do so without complaint and with the utmost integrity and dedication. And it, it is a dedication that saw so many of them go into work every single day throughout the pandemic, putting their own health at risk, not only to execute their duty of care to their prisoners, but also to protect the wider public. And sadly, because they work for the Cinderella Emergency Service, they receive few plaudits and very little thanks. So let me here and now thank our prison staff for everything they've done during the past 18 months, often in very difficult and dangerous environment. So, I'm happy to give way to my honourable friend. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. Can I congratulate him on securing this debate and associate myself with the thanks he's given to prison officers does he agree with me they face a very challenging job, challenging, challenging even for a young uh, 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 officer, and therefore there is a, an overwhelming case for looking again at the retirement age and reducing it. But does he agree with me that we should also ensure that they're safe while doing their job and give them all the protection they need? I, I, I certainly do agree with my uh, uh, right honourable friend, and, and I will be covering all those points as I go through my, my speech. Um, Sadly, uh, sorry, so let me here and now thank which I've done, sorry. Uh, Sir Charles, the truth is that prison officers deal every day with individuals who've been locked up to keep, out, keep the rest of us and our communities safe. Too often, those were, were men and women face violence and hostility for just doing their job. And yet, despite that violence and hostility, which would be challenging for fit young people, these dedicated emergency workers are still being told their retirement age will rise to 68. Uh, happy to give way. Thank you very much. Uh, declaring an interest, I'm a, a life member of the Prison Officers Association. The Lord Hutton said in the, his report of 2011 uh, that the, the firefighters and the police had, in his words, um, a pension of the age of 60 because of the unique nature of their job. We've got prison officers. Can I ask the honourable member a question? In the Commons, there's a lot of people in and around and above the age of 60. How many of them would be able to walk in a prison and grapple with some of the most vicious, violent people in this country? Yes, well, uh, I think the answer... Uh, would, I, I think the answer would be uh, not very many people. Um, I certainly couldn't uh, do it. I, I mean, I've been on the wings of my prisons often, and uh, uh, I, I've always felt the air and the, uh, the, the atmosphere of hostility, not to me, but to, towards everybody in authority. So I think the answer is, uh, is, is not, which is why the prospect of people having to work to 68 is adding to the stress of, of their job. Uh, and that's already more stressful than most people could ever imagine. Uh, we're lucky, those of us that have had an association with our prisons, that we do understand. Uh, what is often overlooked by the public, and many here in Parliament, is that the job of a prison officer is even more dangerous 
than that of people working in the other emergency services, including the police. Now, don't get me wrong. I have the utmost respect for other emergency service, service workers and understand fully the challenges they face. For instance, the police often have to face some very violent people. However, the vast majority of the people with whom they come into contact are innocent members of the public, including those who are victims of the thugs and criminals who break the law. On the other hand, the people who prison officers come into contact with are almost exclusively those convicted of a crime, which means they are regularly in close proximity with challenging individuals. And those individuals may suffer from mental health issues, which is an increasing problem, or have been regular users of drugs, which have had a detrimental impact on their behaviour, including making them more aggressive, uh, impervious often to pain, or more capable of resisting attempts at restraint. Give I'm happy to give way. Thank you, Honourable Member, for giving me just on the point that he's uh, making about drugs. Would he agree with me that the issue appears to be at the moment that there are increasing prevalences of drugs in our prison, making the job that he has outlined very eloquently there of the prison staff even more dangerous than it was 10 or 15 years ago? And therefore, the campaign to press for a lower pension age ought to be uh, agreed to by the government and implemented as quickly and as speedily and as safely as possible. Yes, I do agree with the Honourable Gentleman, and, and, and there is a secondary effect, which I have raised in, in, in my debates before and in Parliament on a number of occasions, and that is that there's a secondary threat to prison officers from the fumes of that, some of those, those, and often prison officers that I've come into contact with have gone into cells and actually been affected by those seriously, and so yes, it is a huge problem, uh, and in addition, uh, uh, we've got to remember that most inmates don't want to be in a prison environment and may be uncooperative at best and aggressive and violent at worst, which makes the expectation that prison officers should have to work until they're 68 not only completely unjust, but also, frankly, dangerous. Sir Charles, I, as I pointed out earlier, police officers and firefighters are permitted to retire at 60 because it is acknowledged, as the Honourable Member said, that they do a dangerous and stressful job, which can be physically demanding and contains significant elements of risk and, uh, and volatility. So why are prison officers who work in equally dangerous and demanding operation environment not treated, treated in the same way? I believe the answer is because, as once again I mentioned, the prison service is the Cinderella emergency service, in which prison officers are treated as second-class emergency workers, not only are they paid less than police officers, but also they are often denied access to the same level of protection as their police counterparts. For instance, prison officers are required to carry a large amount of equipment on a daily basis, estimated at between 2.5 and 3 kilograms in weight. And most prison officers are forced to use only a utility belt to carry their equipment. Now, requests to use similar utility vests to those worn by the police were refused on the grounds that prisoners would find them intimidating. Sir so Charles, I find that reasoning deeply insulting and illogical. Why should a prisoner feel any more intimidated by a prison officer wearing a utility vest than a member of the public who is holding a conversation with a police officer wearing the same style vest? In addition, of course, some prison officers are being denied access to the body-worn cameras which are so vital in providing evidence if assaults, including serious assaults, committed against them are ever to be prosecuted. Indeed, I understand that some prisons have actually been told to stop investing in body-worn cameras until a new system is available in November 2022. Now, whilst this new system is said to be safer and more effective, in the interim, it potentially leaves thousands of assaults unrecorded and unsupported by evidence, which in turn means the perpetrators are less likely to be prosecuted. And it's worth mentioning here that the nearly 79,000 prisoners currently incarcerated by the prison service, 30% have been convicted of offences involving violence against the person. So it should come as no surprise that attacks on prison officers are increasing. According to the Office of National Statistics, there were 8,476 assaults 
on prison staff in the 12 months to September 2020, comprising 35% of all incidents of assault which occurred on the prison estate. 823 of those were serious assaults. Now, the government's definition of serious assault in the context of the prison estate is, and I quote, serious assaults are those which fall into one or more of the following categories. A sexual assault requires detention in outside hospital as an inpatient, requires medical treatment for concussion or internal injuries, or incurs any of the following injuries, a fracture, scored or burn, stabbing, crushing, extensive or multiple bruising, black eye, broken nose, lost or broken teeth, cuts requiring surgery, bites, temporary or permanent blindness. And I've been contacted by many of my constituents who work in the prison service who have suffered such assaults in the line of their duty. And I've seen with my own eyes the appalling results, including broken bones, severe facial industry, injuries, and some life-changing injuries, such as an officer who had his finger bitten off. Sir Charles, let's not forget that such attacks will also have a psychological impact on the victims. And in some cases, such an assault will stay with the officer long after the physical injuries have been healed, potentially for the rest of their life. And whilst the number of assaults has decreased slightly over the course of the pandemic, it's worth noting that even with inmates spending far less time out of their cells, the number is still more than double what it was six years ago. It's, I'm happy to give way. The government are on record as saying that they don't, they don't treat prison officers the same as police officers and firefighters because they don't face the same risks of injury. And that therefore it's not an age thing. Would you share my concern that a prison officer is going to have to be very seriously injured or even die before this government step up and treat them as equals? Yes, sadly, I, ha I have to agree with the, the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, and the, the, the statistics do not bear up, out their claim uh, that the police uh, suffer uh, as many injuries as prison officers. It's simply not the case. And, and one of the problems, of course, is if, if, if somebody does attack a police officer, all hell breaks loose and every effort is made to catch the perpetrator. If a prison officer is injured, it's all hidden under the carpet. The perpetrator gets a slip slap on the wrist if they even get that. The problem is, of course, uh, and the Honourable Gentleman is right, that the, those, the figures I quoted will continue to rise. There's no doubt about it. And with that in mind, is it really fair or safe to not only expect officers in their 60s to restrain violent criminals in their, who happen to be in their 20s or 30s, some of whom have very little left to lose, even if they carry out the most violent acts uh, of which they are capable, but are also potentially entrust the, 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 the safety and well-being of other officers and prisoners to the ability of that prison officer to, to actually um, restrain that, that person. It, it is simply uh, unacceptable. So, uh, so, Sir Charles, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that this is a scenario which might eventually cost lives. Mm. And it surely does beg the question as to why prison officers are not treated in the same way as their fellow emergency workers. Uh, and it's worth reminding the House that Section 8 of the Prison Act 1952 states that serving prison officers shall have all the powers, authority, protection and privileges of police constables. If that being the case, why do prison officers not then have the same equipment to protect themselves as their police colleagues? And why aren't they allowed to retire at 60 like their police yeah. colleagues? Unlike other emergency uh, workers, officers uh, spend their working lives effectively in prison themselves in high security environments and looking over their shoulders, especially when staffing levels on a landing are not as they should be due to difficulties in retention of officers, often as a result of their relatively poor pay and working conditions. And, and, and prison officers face not only physical violence, but also run the daily risk of acts of inmates uh, such as potting, uh, a disgusting and outrageous practice whereby urine or excrement are thrown over prison staff for simply going about their duties and ensuring the orderly running of the prison. 
And, and uh, prison officers also face the risk of exposure, as I've said earlier, to the fumes of powerful synthetic drugs such as spice, which can have uh, health implications if inhaled accidentally. Now, in, in addition to all that, between April 2020 and March 2021, there were 38 instances of hostage taking across the prison estate and 1,217 instances of barricades and prevention of access, whereby one or more offenders deny access to all or part of a prison to those lawfully empowered to have such access by use of a physical barrier and 159 instances of concerted indiscipline, in which I quote, two or more prisoners act together in defiance of a lawful instruction. Of course, because of these things, often officers often need to use physical intervention or force to overcome those situations in which lives may be at stake and time is likely to be of the essence. And it's another example of a situation where officers in their 60s may be put a specific risk. They are targeted by troublemakers as more vulnerable targets because of their age. And this is to the detriment not only to the officer's own safety, but that of their colleagues and inmates. Statistics from the Minister of Justice's own website clearly show that such incidents are far from hypothetical or atypical. Now, whilst prison officers face this relentless threat of violence and aggression, there are other, also other pressures on them which add to their already high stress levels. For instance, prison officers often have to take on the role of informed, informal counsellors, helping people who perhaps have never had any meaningful structure or authority figures in their lives before this point. Trying to help people with addictions or mental health problems or dealing with prop people, prisoners who want to talk about traumatic incidents from their own past, those are stressful for prison officers. Uh, if possible, or near that time, then we could give everybody three minutes to join him and support his campaign. Is that all right? OK, no problem at all. That, you mean, will you six, six, uh, Sorry, four, three four. more minutes. Uh, so everybody gets three minutes. Uh, I got confused about the time there. Sorry, sorry. Uh, I've, got, I've got a little bit more, but not okay. too much more. Thank you. Um, uh, and this is a very important subject, uh, Sir Charles, you know, and, and, and I appreciate the time, but actually my prison officers would expect me to give the full story and nothing but the story. I want the support of your colleagues uh, to get in. Uh, 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 th those stress levels I spoke about will, of course, frequently have an impact upon both physical and mental health. Uh, not only do prison officers have to face all of these challenges uh, I've mentioned, but, of course, like all emergency workers, they work shifts, face a working day in which almost every, anything can happen including potentially for having to make a life or death decisions under fast-moving circumstances. And there is evidence that working a shift pattern can be harmful to physical and mental health and may shorten life expectancy, which in turn erodes the ability of officers to enjoy a well-earned retirement. The longer prison officers are forced to work, the more harm it's likely to do to their health. And for this reason alone, it is beyond understanding why they are currently being forced to work six years longer than a police officer or a firefighter, and younger prison officers face the prospect of working until they're 68. It's possible that the Minister, in her response, will remind me that police officers have to contribute 12% towards their pension and firefighters 14%. And in response, I would remind her that those emergency workers get paid a far higher salary than prison officers. Which leads me neatly to... Uh, could I carry on? Sorry, I, because I, I, I've been told I've got to shut up. Uh, which leads me neatly to an important question. Is it not possible that prison officers might be willing to make a higher pension contribution for an earlier pension date? Now, Sir Charles, the only way to answer that question would be for the government to agree to hold new talks with the Prison Officers Association. So will my honourable friend, for whom I have the immense respect, agree to such a meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman, and he has secured a lot of support from colleagues for his debate, and that is to his credit. The questions that this House has considered the pension age of prison officers, I call John MacDonald. Three minutes each, please. Right. I rest <coughs> in that. Um, I'll declare an interest as a, also an honorary life member of the Prison Officers Association. I'm 
as one of the, my witty colleagues said, the only benefit is possibly a more comfortable cell, but there you are. Um, <laughs> I think the Honourable Gentleman has summed up the argument pr precisely. I just want to remind colleagues that we had this debate some time ago with regard to firefighters and we had it with regard to police. And I can remember the consensus that was built. No one wanted a 60-odd-year-old firefighter coming through that window to carry us down a ladder. No one wanted that. The same nobody wanted to see police at this age, up to 68, going out on the streets trying to defend us when there was such physical assaults that were occurring at the time. Nobody wanted that. The reason that, it, the, reason that the prison officers, to be frank, have been discriminated against is because, like their prisoners, they're locked away and we want to just completely look away from the problems that they experience. And that's the reality of it. And I'm grateful for the Honourable Member, time and time again, for bringing to this House the reality of what the members of the Prison Officers Association and those across the service are actually experiencing, which is the physical nature of the job. But can I also remind people this? When we had the firefighters discussion, we looked at, we had actuarial work done, and one of the interesting things was the number who died soon after retirement. And we couldn't understand it. And part of it relates to the experience in work, but particularly the stress that they were under, causing cardio... If I don't mind, George, I'll, I just want to finish. Uh, causing cardiovascular problems. The same applies, exactly the same as prison officers. And in fact, some would argue more because the nature of the threat is continuous. So I, I, the time has come to, and it's exactly as the Honourable Gentleman has said, the talks need to start to resolve this now. Because none of us want to put these workers through that sort of threat, suffering, stress, all of that, by forcing them to work that much longer. And in addition to that, the point that they were making, this is dedication to the job. Actually, they want to deliver the best service possible. When you get to a certain age, you're not able to guarantee the safety of the prisoners because you haven't the physical resource to do it. And what they want to do is deliver a quality service. We should be supporting them in that. So the appeal is to start the talks again, start negotiating, and if there is to be more paid in contributions, to be frank, actually more should be paid, therefore, in salary to compensate for it. Thank you very much. Rachel Hopkins. And it's a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And I want to congratulate the member for sitting born in Sheppey for securing this really important debate. Violence in prisons, especially against workers, has increased significantly since the mass cuts to staffing and other budgets from the 2013 onwards, with assaults on staff tripling to over 10,000 a year by 2019. This level of workplace violence should be unacceptable for any employee, but there is increased danger for those over 60. It, can't, it simply cannot be right to expect officers in their 60s to control and restrain people a third of their age. Ministers have not provided any evidence to show that frontline prison officers over 60 can work safely in such a dangerous operational environment. And I'm aware that Lord Hutton's report proposed that some uniform services, as we've heard, police, firefighters and the armed forces, should be exempt from the rise in retirement age to 68. The decision excluded prison officers from the uniform services who were spared the retirement age rise, and it has never been explained or justified, which has caused anger and despair among officers. Expecting prison officers to manage, care for, and control violent, dangerous, and difficult people until the age of 68 is quite simply unfair and unsustainable, and as the Honourable Member said earlier, dangerous. We heard the Prison Act 1952 gives serving prison officers all the powers, authority, protection, and privileges of police officers. Quite rightly, police can retire at 60, 60 due to the often violent and volatile nature of their job. So will the Minister explain why prison officers are not afforded the same protection? Pension aid should be negotiated as a standalone issue, but it's clear Ministers see employee contributions as part of this discussion. But these relate directly to pay. And if pay is then going to be on the table, the starting point must be the Prison Service Pay Review Body's recommendation of a £3,000 uplift to entry-level salaries, which the government deemed unaffordable. According to the Prison Service Pay Review Body, officers were said to be leaving the service for supermarkets, the police, border force, railway companies and other security and uniform services, with one prison visited experiencing a turnover rate of almost 25%. Low pay and a high pension age are both reasons why morale is at an all-time low. 
The current recruitment and retention crisis shows we need a complete pay overhaul that makes salaries competitive, attractive and fit for purpose. And if I may, on a final note, I'm concerned about the number of female officers who fail their annual fitness test, and that's growing. And the Prison Officers Association believes menopause may be a factor. The situation is causing accusations of unfair and discriminatory treatment of women. So does the Minister agree that the annual prison fitness test is not fit for purpose and will she commit to replacing it with a system that measures relative fitness considering factors such as age and sex? Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Carl Turner. Thank you very much indeed, Sir Charles. It's always a pleasure to serve under your chairship. And can I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman for... Uh, securing this incredibly important debate. Uh, Sir Charles, I represent the constituency of All East and we have HM Prison Hull, so I want to take this opportunity to briefly thank those prison officers and in uh, indeed staff who serve our community in East Hull and indeed the prison governor, Sean uh, Mycroft. This is a major concern. The reality is I've, in my previous job as a criminal lawyer, I've been instructed on numerous occasions to represent uh, prisoners for adjudications. It always struck me, Sir Charles, the serious nature of those uh, allegations against prisoners and the degree of serious assault caused to prison officers. The idea for me of a 68-year-old man or woman wrestling with a prisoner uh, in order to contain a situation is, you know, utterly, utterly ridiculous. And I would just say this, I'm not going to speak for much longer, but I want to say two things. The government needs to get back round the table and negotiate constructively with a view to dealing with this incredibly dangerous issue. And I want to say this. I know, having served in the Shadow Justice team with my honourable friend, the Shadow Minister, how seriously my honourable friend takes this issue. It's something that we discussed regularly when I was in that team in Shadow meetings. And I know full well that this party, the opposition, We'll deal with this uh, as soon as we get the opportunity if, in fact, the government failed to do that. Thank you very much. Um, Mary Kelly Foy. Uh, thank you, Chair. And oh, I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for Sitting Ball and Sheppey for securing this debate. My constituency, the City of Durham, contains three prisons, HMP Franklin, HMP Durham and HMP uh, Law Newton. Between them, these prisons employ hard work and, and dedicated staff and hold a range of prisoners from low-level offenders to some of the most dangerous people in the country. The Hutton report recommended that police officers and firefighters would rightly be exempt from the rise in retirement to 68. Yet while these workers have a pension age of 60, prison officers were excluded from this, a clear oversight. And Section 8 of the Prison Act 1952 gives prison officers the protection and privileges of police constables. So why are prison officers left with this pension injustice? It appears that the government believe that prison officers deserve equality of powers, protections, privileges, but not of pensions. And make no doubt about it, prison staff do a difficult and dangerous job. On my recent visit to HMP Franklin, I heard from staff directly about the risks they face. And violence in prisons, especially against staff, has significantly increased since mass cuts to staffing from 2013 onwards, with assaults on staff tripling to over 10,000 a year by 2019. And these risks are why lowering the pension age of prison officers would mean so much to the people in Durham because it's my constituents who have to live with the effects of this policy, whether it's the prison officers who just want to feel secure on the landings, or their family who want their loved one in their 60s to be safe at work. And the danger of this policy was perfectly expressed by a prison officer in my constituency who contacted me to ask the question to the minister. Can they picture their parents, grandparents, or indeed themselves at 68 year old trying to stop a young, fit, violent offender with a weapon? If not, 
Why do they expect it of my constituents? Because this is the reality of life on the landings for prison officers, and it's perfectly understandable that staff morale is rock bottom. Because whether it's pay, pensions or working conditions, the government has consistently failed officers. So, ministers, will the ministers do the right thing and commit to a good faith negotiation with the Prison Officers Association on the standalone issue of prison officer pension age? Because 68 is clearly too late. Prison officers are not asking for the world. All they want is to be treated fairly, to be safe at work and to have dignity in retirement. Is that really too much to ask? Yeah. Thank you. Liz Saville Roberts. Dear Kumbarian, Sir Charles, and I, I congratulate the Honourable Member for sitting Bourne and Sheffield for securing this debate. And I'd like to put on record that I am the rise as the co chair of the Justice Union Parliamentary Group, particularly at this time when it is important to refer to register of interests. And I would ask does the government really think it is sustainable to attract new prison officer recruits to work up to 50 years of their lives in prisons as they stand? On top of the dangerous conditions, poor pay, high pension age make for an unattractive proposition for the new staff looking for a solid lifetime career. And these are the sort of staff that the prison service would like to attract. This dereliction of duty by the government as an employer, combined with low pay, pay is helping to drive the current st staffing crisis. And since 2010, the Ministry of Justice's own figures show that over 86,000 years of prison officer experience have been lost. In my own area of North Wales, over 130 Band 3 officers have left HMP Berwyn since April this year, costing on average £13,000 to recruit and train. This amounts to £1.7 million of public money lost and wasted. These key workers are moving on to better paid work that doesn't involve abuse and assaults on a daily basis. And we saw this year just how dangerous the job can be when an officer suffered a near-fatal attack at HMP Swansea, which prompted calls for an inquiry into staff safety. The most recent independent monitoring board, report, that report noted that there were 258 assaults on staff at HMP Berwyn, 22 of which were classed as serious. And I will briefly, if I can do this, put on record something from an exit interview, just to give an experience of the staff. Keeping uh, serious staff assaulters on the prison or returning to Berwyn, and I quote, I have personal experience with this. Order, order. A prisoner who assaulted me was kept... I ask my honourable friend to save that quote. We'll be back in 20 minutes. We will reconvene at 5.22. <laughs> order, order. Liz Savile Roberts. And I would like to put on record a quote from an exit interview from HMP Bowen, because I think it illustrates some of the situations that our prison officers face. And he was referring to uh, keeping serious st staff assaulters in the prison or on returning to Bedouin. And the quote is, I have personal experience of this. A prisoner who assaulted myself and another officer was serving for an assault on an emergency worker. He was a do not return in the system. Some staff are forced to move off their wing. The staff have to leave the wing, while the prisoner who has carried out the assault continues to reside on the wing. Staff are not taken into consideration. And yet, ministers have never provided any evidence to show that frontline prison officers over the age of 60 can work safely in such dangerous working environments. A high pension age also disproportionately impacts older and female staff who are still required to adhere to a universal fitness test. This situation is causing resentment and accusations of unfair treatment to women and discrimination on the basis of sex. And HMPPS's own equality analysis uh, on, of the fitness test shows that 100% of the people who failed both the standard and the adjusted test for the third time were female, which is, I think, a shocking statistic. Also shocking is the, that around 66% of officers who fail the test for the first or second time are also women, given that less than 40% of the prison staff are female. Given that these statistics, how can a pension age of 68 be fair towards women and older workers who physically struggle to stay in the job? Now, I want to close, and on, on pension contributions particularly, I want to close. I understand that this is among the issues which prison officers are prepared to discuss with the minister, although it also has to be recognised, and I wish the minister was here in her seat, although I'm sure I have an opportunity to raise it in a moment, that salaries also need to be far higher than they are at present, because they do not reflect the same situation as those of the police force. So I am proud to support the campaign. 68 is too late. Thank you, Ms. Savile Roberts. Can I just put on, put on the record, not that it's my duty to defend colleagues, but the, the, the vision did go on for some time, and people are stuck in lobbies. I think this is an issue I need to raise with 
various committees, like the Procedure Committee. So I would also accept in that case that I was in the heat of the moment, and I, I will raise it with the Minister. No, and I know you didn't mean it like that. I'm disappointed she's not here, 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 here as well. Mr Lavery. Thank you, uh, Sir Charles. Uh, as ever, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And uh, congratulations to the Honourable Member for Sittingbourne and Sheppey for bringing this uh, really, I, I wish I could say a timely debate, but it's not a timely debate, is it? It's something which we've discussed many, many times before, you know. I actually, eight years ago, as a, a flying PPS to Harry Harmon, um, I actually resigned my position uh, on this very issue because I couldn't for the life of me understand why prison officers uh, would have to work till the age of uh, 68 before they got their pensioners, uh, pension. And you know what? T to be honest, Sir Charles, I still haven't had any answers. We still haven't had any facts, figures or answers to, to, to qualify that Prison officers should work till uh, 68. Uh, Why is it at the same time? And I agree with the fact that the police and, of course, uh, firefighters and they get their pension at 60. Rightly so as well. So that isn't, we shouldn't keep basically having this competition between different frontline public services because it isn't a competition. But what we see is something that's terribly, terribly, terribly unfair. I'll tell you what, what is uh, strange also, Sir Charles, is how we allow a French, uh, a French company who deals in hospitality to be running the prisons or some of the prisons in this country. That is time for another debate in itself. I want to congratulate the staff, everyone, at the, the, the prison at HMP Northumberland. Uh, 68 is too late, uh, Sir Charles. It's far too late. I've been speaking to prison officers who are frightened. I've been speaking to prison officers' families who are frightened. I've been speaking to prisoners who are frightened. I've been speaking to auxiliaries who are frightened. The stress levels in what's happening in the prisons at this moment of time is quite frankly unacceptable. And we have got to deal with it. I'm hoping that the minister, at least in terms of pensions, Sir Charles, the minister will agree, if she only agrees one thing today, it would be that she would agree to meet with the prison officers association and agree a way forward so that pensioners uh, and the prison officers association working in the prisons can get a decent pension at the age of 60. Thank you very much, um, Mr Lavery. It's five minutes from Mr Day. Up to five minutes. Thank you, Sir Charles. I'm grateful to the Honourable Member for sitting Bourne and Shepley for securing today's debate and for opening it in the fashion which he did. He has my full support in the bid to return prison officers' retirement age to 60. And indeed, it's been a very consensual debate throughout the from all members present here today. This is an issue which I've raised a number of times in this Parliament on behalf of my constituents, several of whom are serving prison officers. And in listening to the direct testimony from constituents about having to restrain prisoners and dealing with violent incidents which happen daily across the prison network, it is clearly becoming more and more difficult for officers. And these physical difficulties can only get harder with age. My own visits to HMP Shots and the Paul Mitten Young Offenders Institute have further convinced me that this is indeed the case. Now, while I don't have the latest Scottish figures across England and Wales, there were 7,612 assaults on staff recorded in the 12 months to June 2021, and that would equate to an average of 21 assault incidents every day, a worrying number irrespective of the age of officers involved. Quite simply, if police officers retire at 60, it is only right that prison officers who work on the front line of the prison service are afforded the same right by the society that they protect. The UK government is, in my opinion, letting them down. In addition to the police, the fire service and all the armed forces also retire at 60, and rightfully so. Prison officers ought to be able to retire then as well. 
because they are dealing with very dangerous and violent individuals. We've heard so much testimony to that today. They are not like other civil servants. Their job is a dangerous one. It is and should be treated as a uniformed emergency service. For years, the UK government has said there are no plans to change the retirement age for prison officers. Stonewalling on this issue does nothing for the brave men and women who are providing crucial public services that we rely on for our society's law and order to function effectively. Indeed, when I last raised this issue on the 17th of December last week by way of a public petition from local constituents, ministers never even responded. I think that my constituents in particular and our nation's prison officers in general deserve much better. This simply sends out a message that this government doesn't care. The government repeatedly hides behind its decision to increase pension age as reflecting the generally improving life expectancy. Now, while it's true that people may be living longer, that does not equate to their physical and mental abilities being able to withstand the daily demands faced by prison officers. And given this lack of respect, it is little wonder that the Ministry of Justice's figures show, as we've heard from the Honourable Member, and forgive me the constituency, <laughs> which I probably can't pronounce uh, for, for Wales, uh, that more than 86,000 years of prison officers' experience has been lost since 2010, uh, as experienced officers leave, and no doubt in part, to better working conditions and for higher pay. Budget cuts have seen the prison service impose an almost total recruitment freeze in recent years, so recent movement for pay rises for public workers by the Chancellor is very welcome. But with long hours to fill, significant labour shortages and a volatile situation to police, prison staff are simply becoming burnt out. Prisons were amongst the employers with the most demand for staff in late October and early November, according to the Recruitment and Employment Confederation with adverts for prison officers rising by some 13%. In conclusion, Sir Charles, I am in little doubt that the pension age issue is a very significant factor in that situation. Our prison officers simply deserve better. They should be treated equitably with the police officers and allowed at, to retire at 60. And I look forward to hearing the Minister's view on this. Um, Minister Brown, you have six minutes, given the generosity of our SNP spokesman. Six minutes. I'm very grateful to the, my, our SNP colleagues and to you, Sir Charles. It's an absolute pleasure to see you and to serve under your chairmanship. The view from the front line is absolutely clear. Prison officers and prison governors have told me exactly the same thing. They simply don't believe that they or their colleagues can be safely running around floors in their mid-60s. From the conversations I've had, most of those near in retirement age have decades of service in prisons behind them. Imagine it. Decades of rigorous physical effort, bending through doorways, wrestling with violent prisoners on the floor. The repeated mental strain of conflict, constantly being in flight or fight mode at work. It must be exhausting witnessing and dealing with terrible circumstances day in and day out. And worst of all, dealing with the trauma caused by brutal assaults at work. I'm sure the Minister understands that all of this takes a real physical toll. Because we know, we all know, that being a prison officer means dealing with very damaged people. It means stepping into danger to protect colleagues or prisoners or to stop a situation that's escalating out of control. It means being on your feet for long hours, walking the halls, never knowing when the next crisis will emerge. The minister will note, thankfully, that violence against prison officers fell during the pandemic. But in the most recent stats, the rate of assaults on staff was still 177% higher than it was in 2010. And the level of violence is now growing fast, up 14% in the last quarter. Will I will. Daniel Carr. I'm grateful to my own friend. I have HMP Liverpool and Alt Course Prison in my constituency, and I'm pleased to work with the POA and the prison officers. Would you agree with a prison officer who's written to me who says, we are the police behind these walls, yet police in the community can retire at 60. And isn't this simply 
about decency and fairness for our prison officers? Shadow Minister. I certainly agree with that. It is about decency and it is about treating people fairly and we are simply not seeing it. Whether or not a job becomes more dangerous depends in large part on what happens with recruitment and retention. And that is affected by the government's decisions on pension age. It cannot be said often enough that the safety of our prisons and our prison officers depends on staff experience, the extent to which they and their colleagues have the jail craft to maintain good relationships with prisoners, to understand the real dynamics that's going on in a wing and to de-escalate by using many different mechanisms, dangerous situations before they become violent and out of control. That depth of experience has been stripped away over the past 10 years as more and more long-serving officers have left the service. Prisons today have 25% or more of their staff with no experience at all of pre-pandemic regime. It's, it is frightening. I hope the Minister is going to tell us what plan she has to stop the service from being hollowed out even further. And we rightly have a system where even senior managers walk the wings and respond to incidents alongside colleagues. That must also maintain the ability to restrain big and dangerous adult men if the escalation fails. And they must be kept safe doing it. So, much upward progression still requires operational fitness. And moving to a non-frontline role will often involve a demotion and a pay cut. Faced with these options and retirement still years away, many won't remain in the service. And their enormously valuable experience will be lost. So can I ask the Minister to, to let us know today if she agrees that it's just too difficult to be rolling around the floor with a violent prisoner in your mid-60s? And does she accept that we have a retention crisis in our prisons which impacts on the all-important link between retention and safer working conditions? Over the past year, this government have rightly called our prison officers hidden heroes. So surely it's time to put those warm words into action. We won't solve the problems in our prison system until people know that their skills and their experience will be valued and developed and where their hard work will be rewarded. The whole of this debate, Minister, has simply been asking you to negotiate in good faith and understand the true value and nature of the work, the dedication and the importance of retaining experienced prison staff. Thank you very much, Shadow Minister. Minister. Uh, thank you, Sir Charles. And may I say what a pleasure it is to serve under your chairmanship. And may I start by thanking my honourable friend for uh, sitting born in Sheppey. Uh, he is a, a tireless advocate for the many, many prison officers and staff who live in his constituency, and of course those who <coughs> travel to work there as well. Uh, he has, within days of me being appointed, stopped me um, to tell me, well, to invite me very kindly to visit his three prisons with him and to meet his constituents who work so hard in, in the prisons on, uh, in his constituency. And so I genuinely um, uh, thank him and respect very much the fact that he is raising this issue again. Uh, I think actually, uh, Sir Charles, this is one of those debates where I wish a little more attention was paid to them in in that uh, whilst there are clearly um, very passionately held views across the uh, chamber, uh, nonetheless, this has been, I think, a constructive and a fair debate uh, where the views of prison officers and staff have been put forward. And I genuinely thank honourable members for their contributions. Uh, and I hope also that uh, not just honourable members, but also those who are watching, uh, because I suspect that um, prison officers and staff are watching this debate as well. I very much hope that um, they take from this debate that although I may not be able to um, uh, give some of the answers that honourable members have understandably urged me to 
give today. Uh, I very much want to engage with the Prison Officers Association and indeed with the other unions, or many, many of whom I've had the pleasure of meeting already. I do want to engage with them constructively, not just on the issue of pay, really, really important though that is, uh, not just on pensions, again, absolutely important, I accept that, but also on their working conditions. Uh, Honourable members have been um, kind enough, but also right, I think, today, to outline some of the horrendous circumstances that officers find themselves in um, when they are working uh, w w to contain some of the most dangerous people in our society. Uh, and uh, I'm very, very proud of the Ministry of Justice's scheme uh, that has been rolled out this year, the Hidden Heroes Scheme. Uh, I think that is, um, it, it does, I hope, um, it gives, uh, pays tribute to those officers. Uh, Monwell Friend has, has called it the Cinderella service as well. Uh, and I think it's right, as the Honourable Gentleman, the Right Honourable Gentleman for Hayes and Harlington said, that because um, it happens behind those very, very uh, tall, very thick uh, brick walls, um, it sometimes feels as though they are separate from uh, our wider community and that is something I genuinely want to try to work with the POA, with prison officers, with staff, with governors to shed a little bit more light on what happens behind those walls uh, over the coming years because I think genuinely there are many, many examples of practice and, and of work done that the public not only would be interested in but also be proud of uh, the work that our officers and staff do. Of course. So Greg Knight. To my honourable friend for the positive way in which she's responding to this excellent debate. And whilst the focus of this debate has been on the pension age, uh, will she say a little bit more about the need to make sure that prison officers have the best possible protection whilst at work, including the use of body-worn cameras and, in certain circumstances, pepper spray? Yeah. Minister. Uh, you, I will, because um, I'm so grateful to my honourable friend, um, because uh, he makes a very, very important point about the, the wider terms and conditions, if you like, of employment. Uh, I, I do not want anyone to leave this uh, chamber or listen to this debate thinking that it's somehow uh, acceptable for uh, prison officers to have to um, face the threats, the abuse and indeed the very serious violence that honourable members have set out uh, as part of their workplace. We, we must not, and I know nobody in this room would, but we must not as a society shrug our shoulders and say, oh well, um, what do you expect, or words to that effect. We absolutely can, uh, we absolutely can I think, do more to protect officers in the prison environment. And I'm going to come on to some of the wider measures in a moment. I give way. Yes, Savile Roberts. Very grateful. And I, I do appreciate that in this context, when a request is made to the minister, that it is it, how the minister responds is, is, is a matter of great sensitivity. I would like to ask the minister to, whether she could commit to meet with the Prison Officers Association. They, they are very clear in their, in, in their ask for negotiations to be reopened in, 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 in relation to the, the pension age. But I think if she could commit to, to meet them, just to, to, to discuss this matter further in the first instance, I think that would be very welcome. Minister. Sir Charles, as I said, I've already met uh, the Prison Officers Association. I was, I was very clear, I hope, when we first met, that this was the beginning of a, I hope, a very constructive, very positive relationship. So, of course, I will happily meet them. I'd be delighted if the Honourable Gentleman um, would uh, join me in that meeting. I must, though, I've got, you know, I want to be um, frank. I don't want to be uh, sort of... Um, any claims of you know, inadvertently um, misleading people. Um, I, I can't commit today to discussions on pensions per se, but I'm very, very happy, uh, as I've said in the past, in fairness, to listen to the Prison Officers Association and their members, very, very keen to do so. Um, but if I may just deal if, with, because I'm conscious I do want to give my little friend time to um, respond. Uh, the um, retirement age for prisoners, uh, sorry, for prison officers is linked to their pension arrangements. And of course, prison officers are classified as civil servants, and so are members of the civil service pension scheme. Uh, this is a defined benefit scheme which pays a pension for life without investment uncertainties. It has one of the lowest employee contribution rates across the public sector, and employers make contributions of 27% into the scheme on behalf of the employee. When a new pension age of 65 for new entrants was introduced in 2007, 
It was done so, I'm told, um, following great uh, consideration of the prison officer role and the demands it makes of prison officers and other operational roles in the civil service. Uh, and I'm told again that the POA signed up to this scheme. Following the introduction of the Alpha scheme, which was introduced in 2015, the normal pension age for prison officers is set at state pension age, which is between 65 and 68. Now, there has been, in fairness, if I may, because I'm just conscious, I've got four minutes, if I may. Uh, as I'm conscious, and indeed my honourable friend has um, uh, already made this point, we, we have tried to make change on this before. Uh, and um, the, the Prison Officers Association membership, when they were balloted uh, eight years ago, um, did not accept the uh, package to retire at the lower age of 65 with heavily subsidised additional contributions to the scheme. Uh, and uh, I'm told again that that was, um, uh, uh, well, the, although the uh, Public Office, uh, Prison Officers Association membership rejected this at a ballot, uh, the Prison Governor Association accepted this offer and as a result some manager grade staff now have a lower pension age. Another offer was made in 2017 uh, in which prison officers would have incurred no cost to access a pension age of 65, but again, this was rejected uh, at a ballot of the, um, of the union. I, I'm, if I may, I'm just going to finish, if I'm, because I do want to deal with the security points, I, do want, I must finish at uh, 17.48 to give my honourable friend time to respond. Uh, any lowering of the pension age for prison officers would invariably mean that pension contributions from them would have to increase. Uh, and prison officers' pension contributions are um, less than half that of schemes for, say, the firefighters uh, or police officers. If she's quick, I please. Shadow Minister. I must understand that the... Sorry that the pay for our prison officers is actually lower than the police force, it is lower than the border force. Will she agree today to negotiate in good faith with the POA? I, I'm going, as I've said already, I don't want to waste time by repeating myself, but I, I very much will meet with the POA. I cannot agree uh, on the floor of the chamber to uh, negotiate, but again, I hope the POA, having met me as they have, um, uh, understand that I make that meeting in good offer of a meeting in good faith. I, I do want to emphasise the point about fitness tests because this has been raised. And the, the honourable lady made an interesting point about menopause in particular. Um, since 2001, officers have had to pass an annual fitness test. And uh, this is based on requirements of the role, for example, their strength, their muscular endurance, speed, and agility. Uh, no specific adjustments um, have been made in relation to menopause because uh, we must uh, apply those tests equally. However, it is on the, on the, basic of, the basis of the specific needs of the individual. It is intended to be both age and gender neutral, uh, as, and I'm sure colleagues will understand that uh, we must be very, very careful not to discriminate on the uh, basis of age in such circumstances. Uh, I was very, very um, conscious of um, the contribution, the huge contribution that older uh, and more experienced officers make. They can often de-escalate situations and they can help newer recruits to really uh, learn to do the job as well as they can. But on the important issue of security, we are investing £100 million in a prison security package uh, and uh, it includes things like x-ray scanners. It also uh, includes uh, body-worn cameras and uh, parva spray. We want to um, have this rolled out alongside rigid bar handcuffs to give officers that support of those items. I'm going to sit down now, Sir Charles, but as always, I very much look forward to discussing this further with honourable colleagues. Miss, Mr Henderson, you have um, one minute, 45 seconds. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Charles. Um, um, whilst I accept uh, that uh, the Minister can't uh, accept preconditions uh, about any uh, uh, meeting, I do welcome the fact that she has committed to meet with the Prison Officers, Officers Association to discuss their concerns. I think that's uh, a step forward. Um, perhaps one of the issues the Minister might like to discuss with the POA is whether they would actually prefer to no longer be classified as civil servants and, and actually be, instead be dealt with in the same way that the police officers are. Um, uh, could I also repeat my invitation 
uh, for her to visit the Isle of Sheppey, and I'll be delighted to show her around not only the prisons, but some of our lovely countryside there. Um, and then finally, could I say how grateful I am to those of my colleagues uh, who have uh, bothered to turn up today to support our prison officers, and could I suggest gently that they might like to consider joining the Prison Service Parliamentary Scheme, for which Liz and I are co-founders. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mr Henderson, for leading an excellent debate on behalf of your constituents. The question is that this House has considered the pension age of prison officers. As many of them say aye, of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. A Rolls-Royce ride for your chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you soon. See you soon.